So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sharon Whiteman and I'm part of the team, the executive team at the Lyme Disease Association of Australia. And this, uh, we're doing a little series here in the, the month of May, 2022, to you know, bring in some global overview on what's happening in Australia and, on, and to benefit uh, sick current and future sick Australians that have a tick-borne disease or you know, multi-pathogen stealth illness that's not being treated in Australia at this time. We're very privileged to have Dr. Monica Embers. She's currently an associate professor of the Division of Immunology and the Director of Vector-Borne Disease Research at the Tulane National Primate Research Center. Her research program regarding Lyme disease and its infectious cause, Borrelia burgdorferi, specializes in animal models. The research is centered around three major efforts. One, identifying treatments that eradicate B. burgdorferi infection. Two, detection of persistent Lyme disease spirochetes in human autopsy and surgical discard tissues. And three, immunodiagnosis for B. Borrelia burgdorferi infection and cure. By transmitting Lyme disease to mice and non-human primates by tick and studying the natural course of infection, her group aims to attain a better understanding of the clinical quandaries of human Lyme disease, including effective diagnosis and treatment. Due to the many similarities between Bartonellosis and Lyme disease, her team has begun to develop research models for Bartonella infection and assess vector transmission of this pathogen as well. Wow, what a big job, Monica. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me. So that, let's go back to the beginning. How did you become involved in tick-borne disease research? Was there a personal drive or it was just an interest? Well, interestingly, um, as a graduate student, I was, I was very interested in how pathogens evade the host immune response and cause persistent infections. And I came across this article on Borrelia and I, I presented it at Journal Club and it, it just, I just, it was so amazing to me. And I started to learn about all the, way the ways that Borrelia can evade and suppress the host immune response. And uh, I ended up asking the, uh, main author of that paper, if I could do a postdoctoral fellowship in his lab. And that's how I ended up at Tulane. But I was in Pennsylvania for my graduate studies um, <clears throat> at Penn State, and Lyme disease was becoming more and more prevalent there. And we know it's one of the top states in the U.S. that's uh, afflicted with Lyme and tick-borne disease. Wow. And how, how many years have you been doing this, Monica? 19. Yeah. Oh, wow. And it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're making progress? I do. I do. Um, it's never easy. It's, it's always a, a tenuous process. Um, the scientific uh, inquiry takes time to do it right. And, um, and I think for me, it's very important that we do do it right because we, we, we don't want to make mistakes about um, results that we have or conclusions that we make about them because it's so important for patients that that um, we have our data um, validated and correct. So um, I'm not one who rushes out to publish everything I see until I'm you know until I've checked it a couple of times you know to make sure that that it's solid. So mm -hmm. I have an example. One uh, recently we published. Um, an article about a case report of a woman who had developed Lewy body dementia. And um, we, we very thoroughly described the methods that we used and, val and how we validated them. And then we, we described finding Borrelia in her brain and spinal cord. And um, having, after even after publishing that, we continue to find um, Borrelia in, in the specimens from this particular patient. So I, there's no doubt in my mind that what I, you know, what we published is solid and, and real. So. <clears throat> so did you get any pushback on that? Like there, there seems to be some non-scientific bias against persistence with these infections. Do you, do you have a, any understanding why that is? You know, there's always some pushback because, um, there are small caveats to, um, to the findings that, that people can nitpick at. Um, and 
I think, you know, there was a paper that came out saying, no, Borrelia does not cause Alzheimer's, but I don't think we said in our paper that Borrelia causes Alzheimer's. We said, here's a patient who was treated for Lyme disease, progressed to dementia, and still had a persistent infection. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, and it's been the argument for a long time that because we haven't been able to reculture spirochetes from infected animals after antibiotic treatment, they're not really alive. And uh, we've gone to great lengths to show that they are in fact uh, viable. So um, there's always gonna be some kind of pushback and I think it's mostly related to uh, disagreement over how patients should be treated um, in, in terms of antibiotic treatment, not, <laughs> not treated, treated, but how their, um, the antibiotic treatment regimens that are used. Hmm. So I know um, in Australia, there's only a small, you know, with the sort of failure of health policy here in Australia, there's only a very small number of treating doctors left. And really, practically, there are no open doors. The, the books are closed and they're overwhelmed with the patient load that they have already. So, you know, potentially there'll be, you know, we estimate, even if you look at the global um, prevalence of maybe 5.8, that's what China reports. I know I had a, a discussion with Dr. Schlofel this week and he said, well, our prevalence can be that high because, you know, have you seen, have you ever lived in China? And I said, well, I visited, but no, I didn't live there. And that they live amongst their animals and in the house in some of the rural areas and that he reckons that would cause a, a more high prevalence. But um, I think, you know, the rest of the world, sometimes they report 5.4. So that's still, that's bringing up around 20,000 new cases a year and probably 500,000 cases over the last 25 years of saying it's not in Australia. So right now we're in a desperate situation for not only the people who are suffering now, but people who are going, my, my son had a, a tick and a rash this week. And, um, and he, he's a potentially congenital limey. And he, I, I've been very vigilant about watching him and he's out of the three of our children, he's had sort of a fatiguing type of illness. And so I've been really hyper vigilant with him. And so immediately, you know, and he doesn't even go in the bush or go anywhere. He just say, hey, I've got something on my shoulder. My shoulder has been sore for two days and it was a tick. So, you know, there's just so many people in Australia who are at such high risk. So we're very grateful for you to be doing this kind of work because um, really a spotlight needs to be shone. And, and well, I've seen quite a lot of uh, reports lately out of the US at, at the increasing incidents there as well. So absolutely. I my, wanted to highlight the advanced. Go ahead. I was just going to say my, my modus operandi is that, you know, we need to arm clinicians with the tools they need to cure the infection. And we haven't figured that out yet. So um, so, so that's really our goal is to find the right combination of antibiotics or novel therapeutics that can eradicate the infection and prevent people from developing these chronic um, symptoms. So for any um, scientists or medical professionals or patients that have um, doubts about persistence, can you just outline briefly what the evidence is showing so far globally? I know I've watched um, an interview with or a pr presentation by Dr. Ockott out of John Hop Hopkins this week. And he says it's absolutely confirmed that th these pathogens do persist. So can you just make it simple for those of us that need to understand what this is all about? Yeah, I think um, it's pretty well, it's been pretty well established, at least in mice, that, that Borrelia uh, persists long-term, um, you know, as, as a matter of fact. Um, <clears throat> And then, and then there's a the persistence in the presence of antibiotic treatment. Um, and I think that uh, I'm going to be a little, <laughs> a little biased here, but I really think that our studies in non-human primates are, um, are pretty definitive. Um, so there are, there, there's one study in, in mice that I absolutely love. And this was a study that um, Amir Hadzik and Steve Barthold did. And what they did was they infected mice and they waited a period of time for the infection to disseminate, and then they treated them. And they used a quantitative PCR to determine the level of spirochetes in the tissues over time. And when they did that after the treatment, 
they went out, you know, two months, four months, eight months, and they saw that there were very, very, very low levels <clears throat> of spirochetes. And then when they looked at 12 months after the cessation of treatment, the levels of spirochetes in those mice were equivalent to those that were untreated with, with antibiotics. Uh -huh. So that basically proved that they were there all along and they just resurged after a period of time. I think they enter this um, slow growing dormant phase and that's why it's so hard to see in people. And so uh, in the non-human primate model, we have the advantage of uh, looking in tissues and looking, I mean, because it's, it's very hard to culture from blood or urine or any other kind of um, bodily fluids that you could normally take from a human. Um, and when we did that, we not only found spirochetes in different tissues, but we were able to recover them by uh, xenodiagnosis where we place uninfected ticks on the, uh, the, the primates that had been infected. And then when those ticks feed, they take up the bacteria and we can prove that they're still there. So, and I don't, I can't think of any way that this, the bacteria could get into the ticks without being alive. So people have argued that, well, you don't prove that they're alive just because they are taken up by the ticks. They might still be in the blood cells, but most immunologists will tell you that after a year, I mean, we did 12 and 14 months after initial infection in, in non-human primates and still picked up the bacteria. You know, that if you, if you put dead bacteria into a host, they're not gonna survive that long. So, um, I think they're migrating to the site of tick feeding. We've shown that they're making RNA, which is indicative of metabolic activity. And um, I think the evidence is very strong that they're still alive and viable. And so um, what's, your, what's your progress now? Like what, what are you planning to do next? What do, you, do you have a vision and what would you hope for um, the science side of things for this? I do. Um, so, so we have a couple of different avenues of research, which I, which you which you outlined in the beginning. Um, so, an, another argument has been that it hasn't been proven in humans, and so uh, the case report that I just told you about uh, showed evidence in humans, and we have more case studies. And unfortunately, we have uh, specimens from people who have passed away. And, and, and we have their autopsy specimens and we use those to interrogate them for uh, Borrelia. And, and in all cases, they've been treated, uh, but they didn't improve. And so I don't think there's any question in my mind at this point that uh, the standard antibiotic treatments, especially doxycycline, are insufficient. Especially, they're insufficient and we've shown it most notably after prolonged infection. So a lot of people who are treated immediately after a tick bite have much better prognoses than those who go for a period of time without being diagnosed. And so for those people, uh, I think doxycycline is not working like it should. I don't think it should be recommended. And I think we are going to have to take the same approach that we take with uh, tuberculosis, where we treat with a combination of antibiotics because you know they act on different parts of the bacteria and so we need to be able to kill not only the actively dividing bacteria which doxycycline will do but also the slow growing dormant persisters which other drugs can do so um, we have been going through many different um, drugs and drug combinations to try to identify those that will eradicate um, infection in mice. And we've had some very um, good results, some very positive results. And um, I think just like cancer, it's easy to cure mice of cancer, but we're, we, we have yet to cure all human cancers, right? So um, the, sa the same boat's true for, uh, for Borrelia. We can, we can cure a mouse, but um, the be all end all is whether or not we can cure a human. Or, and, mm. and I think the preclinical studies in non-human primates uh, will be very useful for that, for that purpose. 
Um, so we're also working with a group at uh, Duke uh, in NC State uh, on, on the Bartonella and the Borrelia front in identifying novel compounds that can block the activity of the bacteria very specifically. And uh, there are two ways that can be used. So these small molecules will, will bind to proteins, specific proteins in the bacteria, and they can be attached to certain things. So they might be attached to, uh, for example, a PET imaging probe, a radioisotope. And uh, we're asking the question, could you use that molecule to probe individuals for persistent infection? Um, and the other uh, sort of trick you can play is to, to link that um, small molecule to something that's toxic. Mm -hmm. um, Vertiporfin is the, the classic example where you uh, shine a light of, of a certain wavelength and it actually um, causes toxicity for the bacteria and it will kill them. So that's, it, it, we call it like delivering a toxic payload to, to the bacteria. So there are nonspecific uh, combination antibiotic therapies that we're looking at and also highly specific therapies. And there's no reason that um, we can't combine them if we need to. Um, certainly, it's my opinion that we need to eradicate the infection in order to cure the disease. And I think there's some validity to people saying there can be long-term consequences or sequelae from an active infection that was treated, but if it wasn't treated effectively, mm -hmm. then the propensity for long-term chronic symptoms increases significantly. So that's, that's our goal basically to, to find a way to eradicate the bacteria. And this applies to both Bartonella and Borrelia. Well, that's really important research for those of us suffering. I had both um, and probably do still Bartonella and Borrelia. It's not, it's not a walk in the park to experience um, this disease. And we, you know, our heart is really with all the people of Australia and around the world that are experiencing this and, and not being able to get on top of it. So this kind of research is, you know, really vital to be able to get the the doubters, the doubters, there's such strong doubters in the, in the Lyme disease medical and science community. So um, this kind of work is, is really important. So Monica, what do you think is the hope for, for Lyme patients in the future? And what, and what, what message would you give, say, medical doctors or other scientists who are, you know, persisting in um, their belief that persistence of these pathogens is not a valid <clears throat> reality? I'd say, I'd say read the papers, read the literature out there. Um, the animal studies are very strong. It's a difficult study to do in humans. Um, the one, you know, xenodiagnosis study that was done in humans um, was, was a very tricky study. And, and there was one patient who uh, ended up positive, a, a post-treatment Lyme disease patient was positive by um, xenodiagnosis. So I can't, uh, I'm not a clinician and I can't make recommendations, but I can tell you that what I've seen um, in, in all these preclinical treatment trials that we've done is that monotherapy or a single antibiotic does not seem to work in terms of killing um, the Borrelia, whereas combinations do. Um, the, the data on pulse dosing is, I think, insufficient. So I know that a lot of clinicians consider pulse dosing. Um, the in vitro, there is no in vivo data. So there's no data in animals to prove or disprove the, the validity of that. Um, and, the, and the in vitro data is, depends on the antibiotic, basically. Mm. So I think, you know, our goal is really to come up with a, a combination or a group of combinations of drugs that uh, can be effective in a 30-day interval. It doesn't have to be a long-term treatment. And I, I'm not convinced that if, um, if doxycycline doesn't work in 30 days, I don't think it's going to work in 90 days, oh. right? So, um, so I think it's important to consider um, trying combinations or cocktails of antibiotics that are safe 
and approved and we need to determine first what's going to work in, in animal models. And what's the timeline for that, Monica? Uh, well, everything, everything costs money. Um, and we've been, we've been very fortunate to receive um, funding from some, some foundations such as the Stephen and Alexander Cohen Foundation, the Bay Area Lyme Foundation, and Global Lyme Alliance. Um, <clears throat> and I think probably within a year, we should have some non-human primate data to share. Um, the mouse data will come a little bit sooner, but we've tested 17 different um, antibiotics so far oh, awesome. in animal models. So yeah, it's, um, it's really important to, to, to think about how it affects the patient in the long term. So uh, our focus has really been on oral antibiotics, something that could be taken in a 30 day uh, oral regimen instead of injectables or, or intravenous antibiotics. Awesome. So um, I want to, on behalf of, you know, sick Australians, mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing and for your time today. And um, hopefully, you know, they can get some of their, I mean, it's pretty hard to get doctors with open minds, but we hope that this kind of information and education getting out can make a difference bit by bit for the experience of, of the people in Australia suffering from Lyme and associated diseases. So Monica, is there anything in your heart you wanna say for those people? Uh, I just, I'm motivated every day by patients and the stories that I hear and knowing that people are suffering. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge benefit for me uh, to be able to communicate with the people who are affected by the disease that I study or the diseases that I study. And um, I try really hard to convey that to my lab members as well, um, as much as possible. And um, believe me, we have, we have everyone's health interest in mind uh, with all that we do. Uh, we want to be right about it. First, first and foremost, we want to be right about it. And um, secondly, we we hope that the, the research that we do will have a, a positive impact um, for patients who are suffering. Well, we're really grateful, Monica. And I know um, we've had a quiet moment with the Scientific Advisory Committee in Australia, but we will be, I wanna thank you for being a part of that and we will be uh, meeting again in the near future. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you.